Budget airlines have been the butt of jokes for years. The airline industry is testing a virus-killing robot that uses ultraviolet light to disinfect planes. Not to be outdone, Spirit Airlines just taped a glow stick to a Roomba. Spirit Airlines, the cargo hold is our first class. But some companies, like Irish low-cost airline Ryanair, have embraced this role, making humor its brand. Let me explain something to you. I set the rules, and you follow them blindly. Still, the business of these no-frills airlines is no laughing matter. Low-cost carriers now make up almost a third of all global airline capacity. Over the past 25 years, almost every single year, budget airlines like Southwest, like Spirit and Frontier gain about a percentage point of market share. Shares of low-cost European airline Ryanair up by 8.5% this morning. The company is also forecasting a record annual profit. For the first half of its fiscal year, Ryanair said earnings were up nearly 60% from its previous record. This is a model that has kind of proliferated around the world, so it's not just in Europe, it's not just in the U.S. Low-cost airlines have sprung up in Latin America, they've sprung up in Asia, and they're really trying to stimulate a market that maybe was a population that didn't fly before. To find out more about how budget airlines work and why airlines in Europe are able to offer even cheaper fares than their U.S. counterparts, CNBC decided to try out Europe's largest low-cost airline, Ryanair. So we're now on board. There's a couple interesting things like here. Low-cost airlines are always trying to save money. So you'll see on some of these low-cost carriers, they don't have the paper safety card, but they have the safety card on the back of the seat like this. Low-cost airlines, what a lot of people think that means is that they're getting a really cheap fare. But low-cost has a lot more to do with the airline and how it's run and their special attention that they pay to cost. The low-cost business model was first implemented by Pacific Southwest Airlines in 1949 and perfected by Southwest Airlines in the early 1970s. Back then, Southwest offered frequent cheap trips between several cities in Texas. Today, Southwest service has evolved to more closely resemble a hybrid between conventional and low-budget airlines. In the U.S., popular low-cost carriers include Spirit Airlines, Allegiant, and Frontier, among others. Budget airlines in Europe include EasyJet, Ryanair, and Wizz Air, while Asia is served by players such as Air Asia and Indigo. Some of South America's low-budget airlines include JetSmart, Goal, and Wingo. One way that these airlines keep costs down is by limiting their amenities to the bare minimum. Think no internet or seatback entertainment. They tend to entice travelers with low base fares and then charge for add-ons such as seat selection, food, and luggage, all of which frequently add up to more than the fare itself. It's a practice known in the business as unbundling. In the U.S., this comes with some tax benefits for the airlines. There is a federal excise tax of 7.5% that airlines have to pay on all flights. What that 7.5% excise tax does not apply to are any optional add-on fees. So when you purchase a $100 flight, and that includes checked bags, that includes seat selection and whatnot, the airline still has to pay $7.50 in tax on that $100. But instead, if you purchase a $50 ticket and then have to pay $50 to check a bag, to pick your seats, to buy a drink, the airline only has to pay that excise tax on the $50 ticket that you purchase, not the $50 in add-on fees. In more recent years, full-service airlines have started to compete directly with low-budget airlines. This idea that you can purchase a cheaper ticket on Delta or United or American, but it comes with fewer privileges. You know, it doesn't let you change the ticket. It doesn't include seat selection. It doesn't include a check bag. This idea of basic economy is only about a decade old, but it's how the full service airlines have kind of settled on competing with the budget airlines. Key to a budget airline's success is keeping a close eye on its operational costs by maximizing time spent in the air and passenger volume. Most U.S. airlines, interestingly, ultra-low-cost carriers, they charge more for a carry-on bag than a check luggage because with carry-on bag, it takes longer to turn a plane around. So it's more cost savings if you check your luggage for them than if you carry it on. Load factor is kind of the name of the game, getting as many people on those planes as possible. These are single class planes. These are not planes that have a first class. They pack them with seats. 
Along with having a single class on board, most low-budget airlines operate fleets with just one model of airplane, which streamlines pilot training and plane maintenance. Budget airlines also tend to fly out of smaller airports with less traffic, where they can negotiate better rates for using the airport. Still, by far the largest expenses are fuel and labor. You typically see pilot pay a little bit lower on Spirit and Frontier and some of the budget airlines compared to the full service airlines. So you see lower labor expenses. We just finished up a big shoot in Oslo, Norway, and since we're in Europe, we decided to try one of the biggest low-cost carriers, Ryanair. Our goal was to get to Milan. To really test out the airline, we decided to take two separate flights. The first flight was from Oslo to London Stansted Airport, about 40 miles outside of central London. So we are on a very short flight. I did try to order a cocktail, but they did not have the in-flight cocktails that they had in the app. Instead, I got a coffee, which cost me three euros. From there, we flew into Milan's Bergamo Airport. Where budget airlines really kind of have the most competitive advantage are on short flight. So the fact that Europe has a lot more density and large cities packed close together is a sort of ripe environment for budget airlines. Looking at the data of the average fare price per mile for Ryanair as compared to U.S. budget airlines Frontier, Allegiant, and Spirit, you can see Ryanair tickets have been consistently cheaper. Experts attribute this to a few different reasons. First, there are many more secondary airports in Europe compared to the U.S. And those secondary airports are going to be less convenient as a traveler. Oftentimes they're further out, but they're much cheaper for the airlines to fly into or to take off from. So you can see those savings passed on to travelers. How much do you usually pay? 15, um, 15 euros. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cheap. There are typically more airlines flying within Europe compared to the U.S. You know, the U.S. aviation landscape has really gotten whittled down over the past few decades. Many airlines have either merged or met their untimely end, whereas European airline competition is much more robust, in addition to having a lot more competition with trains. The base fare for the first leg of my trip was $47.25 but that would have allowed me only a small bag. I ended up going with the most expensive fare for $146.30, which included a small bag, as well as a carry-on suitcase and a reserve seat. I paid an extra $24 for a 10-kilogram check bag and was given the option to purchase additional services, such as a fast pass through security and insurance. After adding in a credit card fee, my total came to $175.63. For my second flight to Milan, the base fare started at $36.58, but I ended up paying $101.67 in total with add-ons and fees. On the day of our trip, October 6th, a Friday, we ran into a snag pretty early on. Unlike the U.S., you have to check in at a separate counter. You can't check your bags and check in at the same counter. So they're sending us to the check-in counter where we need to go now. So we came over to the service desk, which is very, very long. There are all these self-service centers right here, which I would easily use, but Ryanair doesn't seem to have any. I did try to check in on the mobile app, but it wouldn't accept my passport, so that's why I'm here. Thank you. After getting checked in, we walked over to another counter to drop our bags before heading through security. During boarding, we hit another road bump. So we are in line to board our Ryanair flight. The lady out front told me that this bag is bigger than what I already paid for. So we're gonna see if they notice. Um, they might weigh it. Uh, we'll see what happens. Hello. Hey. Yeah. Yes. Hello, can you just put your bag over there? Sure. Oh. An inch over? No, take that one on board. It's all camera gear. Like, I really need to take it on board. They said I could pay extra. It doesn't matter if they're paying extra because it's big in the... It has a hand luggage size. Just remove your camera stuff and take it between the hand luggage. Okay. The bags can be smart. They're not letting us take this bag on the plane. 
So we had to unpack all of the really expensive uh, lenses and cameras and we're hand carrying them uh, instead of in the very safe bag that we brought it in. Checking the camera bag at the gate cost me an extra $55.44, which brought the total of my first flight up to $231.07. So we are in flight on our Ryanair flight between Oslo and London. So far, everything's going pretty smoothly. We took off on time. The overhead bins are actually pretty small, so I don't know that our bag would have fit um, on this plane because it's an older 737. The seat is just as comfortable, I feel, as other airlines that I've been on. We're actually sitting in the exit row, so we have a little bit more room. But besides that, so far, it feels like any normal flight. So we just landed in London. Let's go see if our bag made it. Despite just kind of the frustration of not being able to get our bag on the plane, we checked it, it's here, nothing is broken. We still had to pay extra. I'm gonna to try to get money back for what I had already paid, but um, the bags are here. Then it was on to Milan. We decided to check the bag this time because it's cheaper to pay for it out here uh, and just kind of avoid the hassle that we went through this morning. So we just got off our second flight from Ryanair from London to Milan and overall I'd say flying Ryanair was actually pretty easy. Both of our flights were on time, they're really efficient at boarding and deboarding. We got on quickly, we got off quickly. The biggest hang up was that first bag earlier this morning from Oslo. It was just too big and we ended up overpaying to get it on the aircraft. But you know, if you're looking to fly cheaply and not bring a lot of stuff, Ryanair is a great option for travelers. Business-wise, the last couple of months have been a mixed bag for budget airlines. In the U.S., Spirit, Frontier, and Allegiant all reported losses in the third quarter of 2023, typically the strongest quarter for many airlines since it includes the busy summer travel months. As a result, many of these airlines were offering deeply discounted tickets. The U.S. ultra-low-cost airlines think of Frontier and Spirit have had a difficult few months. Demand after the pandemic is starting to soften, especially for uh, some of the domestic destinations. You know, people are going abroad again, but they are also facing higher costs, which is the exact thing that they want to keep down, but it's out of their control when they're looking at things like fuel, labor, and that's not the combination that you want. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, European budget airlines seem to thrive, with EasyJet and Ryanair reporting record numbers for that same quarter. We think more and more people are going to trade down from these very high airfare, high fare airlines in Europe to flying Ryanair. We're the number one airline in most of the European markets uh, across Europe. We carry 184 odd million passengers this year, and we expect to hit 200 million passengers next year. So why are European budget airlines thriving when U.S. ones are struggling? It may be explained by the most basic of economic drivers, supply and demand. This summer was really strong for the ultra low cost carriers in the US. It was as you headed into the fall that really things started to slow down. And part of it is the capacity. The capacity in the US, it was slightly above 2019 levels over the summer. But as you got into those fall, it was kind of, you know, seven, eight percent above 2019 levels. Whereas in Europe, it's still below 2019 levels. Capacity across Europe is heavily constrained. I mean, Europe at this summer is operating about 92, 93 percent of pre-COVID capacity. Without Ryanair's growth, that would be probably only 90 percent. And so people are dying to go traveling again. We've seen this summer our fares go up 24 percent, but that's 24 percent increase on a much lower airfare mm -hmm. than the kind of airfares that Lufthansa and Alitalia and, and Air France are, are charging. And we think we'll continue to benefit from that, even if the consumer is a little bit pinched. Perhaps somewhat unexpectedly, legacy U.S. airlines are also not seeing the same hit to their bottom lines as low-budget airlines in the country. Fares for premium products have been more resilient coming out of this pandemic than for some of the very basic economy fares. So that has helped the, the legacy carriers. And then beyond that, especially this year, the transatlantic has been really strong. And that's really also helped legacy airline margins as well. Still, there are some serious challenges facing all airlines, regardless of region or carrier class. Some of the challenges they could face, of course, a potential recession. They also face higher costs. You know, labor costs have been going up. 
And then also the U.S. airspace can be very congested. So there are certain airports that it makes it hard for them to grow. Other factors like supply chain challenges in the case of Ryanair and technical issues in the case of Spirit are also making it difficult for these companies to grow. Meanwhile, in Europe, strengthen EU rules designed to tackle airline carbon emissions mean the industry's operational costs will increase, a cost likely to be passed on, at least partially, to the consumer. But Kai says he has no doubt the budget airline model will live on. Almost every new airline that starts is in the budget airline model, trying to target that thrifty, budget-conscious traveler because that's the trend in the industry. That's what people expect, cheap tickets, and they understand that there's going to be some amount of add-on fees that they're going to have to stomach in order to get that cheap ticket to begin with. 